Welcome, everybody, to episode 20 already of the Cefalo Show. It's kind of a milestone, I guess. Um, uh, we are Cefalo, uh, cefalo.com. Uh, for those who don't know us, visit us on, on the website. Uh, Matt, are you here with the production? Let's do a quick wave. Yes, I'm doing, here, Matt? as always. Um, Life in the fantastic. Office. <laughs> I guess I slept a little bit better than you, so... Uh, you know, so, so it, was, it was not my night. <laughs> <laughs> it was not my night, but let's stop with that. Let's look at the Cefalo website. Thanks, Matt. Um, so if you go to cefalo.com, we had this whole new rebranding for those who hadn't seen it yet. Uh, you can use with QR code, downloads on the App Store on uh, Android. Uh, if you scroll down all the way to the bottom, uh, you can find our social media channels. You can also find the live prices, as you see here. Uh, most importantly, for those who want to engage with us or uh, with other uh, crypto users or shareholders of Cefalo, uh, go to Discord, uh, where we have an active community. And uh, for those who are interested in our stock, you go to the investor page and you can see all the information about our share, where it's uh, traded and uh, what the uh, latest news is in the newsroom. Um, and with that, I'd like to welcome... Uh, for the second time to the show, we were looking at the the, the number of when it was the last time, uh, what show number it was, uh, but I didn't uh, get enough time to check that. Uh, Ichem Wu from Tesseract, uh, welcome. Fantastic, always always glad to have a chat with you. And just in case, uh, in case you missed, it was number seven. So that was uh, number seven. Um, See, I, I num knew... Number seven was the, the the number seven was the episode. Those are the moments that I cherish in my heart. Uh, <laughs> The number seven. Lucky number seven. Yeah, 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 number seven. That's uh, number seven is 20. Let's uh, let's see what we're gonna be when you guys hit uh, episode 40 or 50. We will, uh, all yeah. Gonna, three, uh, yeah, we'll turn it into a Tesseract trilogy. I think, uh, I think that'd be great. <laughs> yeah, Tesseract uh, trilogy. Well, I mean, well, you guys haven't been sitting still since the last episode, that's for sure. Can you walk us through? Uh, I don't know how long was it ago, uh, about a year or so, more, right? Yeah, Roughly exactly. a year. Yeah, yeah, it was in, so maybe, maybe, uh, I think that was the early days of pandemics. So that was a bit over a year ago. Yeah. So, so can you run us through what happened since we spoke then? Uh, because you guys went through quite a journey uh, during this time. Yeah. So, so I think last time when we spoke uh, uh, on the on, on the podcast, we were like what, like four or five people, and uh, just mm -hmm. you know, getting a lot of things started. It start trying to figure out like exactly what is a product market fit and whatnot. And then I think a few months right after, uh, right after what, uh, right after our conversation, we went out there and did a did a twenty five million dollar uh, funding round. So that was Chevy? probably. Uh, well, yeah, yeah. So so it was it was a funny thing. I think I think we 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 weren't planning to do any fundraise. It just uh, just kind of sort of happened. A bunch of people just kind of. A bunch, bunch of throw investors mo throw money at you. <laughs> I, I think, I think the timing was really great, right? Because that was the time in which the the Bitcoin price was 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 mm -hmm. was just coming down from the all time high. So I think people still mm -hmm. have that level, general level of enthusiasm in the market. And then, yeah. uh, and then the company was on a, a decent level of growth tra trajectory. Just started to picking up as we find out some of the product market fit. So we raised some money from you know Coinbase and whatnot and a bunch of investors. So super lucky to get that done. And then, awesome. and it was it was really funny. Uh, one of the local newspaper actually wrote, wrote wrote a piece on it, and then it turned out to be that uh, it was the largest A round that Finland has ever seen, which we didn't know. Oh wow! So, yeah, oh, yeah, I know, right? So, so, smiley face. If I could, yeah, right smiley now, face. You know, name it, you come. Yeah, then the company grew quite a lot. They had cons, I think. Like we have about forty people now, or so. Uh, uh, yeah. Move to uh, move, move to a new office, so that's pretty nice. Uh, other than that, just continue crunching. In Helsinki, uh, still. Yeah, yeah, in Helsinki mostly, mm -hmm. but we we are hiring talents globally. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. as you know, you know, crypto never a boring day. One bit, uh, like one Bitcoin at a time, right? So <laughs> exactly. Maybe we could take it one step back for those who don't know Tesseract. Uh, start from the basics on, uh, mm. you know, the family story, what Tesseract is about, and then maybe we'll jump back on, on, uh, you know, the, the yeah. latest and greatest yeah. of uh, what yeah. you guys have been up to. Yeah, yeah. I think I think I think you're still. Yeah, this is the yeah this is a current website in which we're in the process of uh, of revamping. I think when we did this one, we specifically wanted to be as big as possible because we're really mm -hmm. B2B facing. So so it doesn't really tell you much about what we actually do. So at the end of the day, 
our firm has been around for about five years or so, uh, much in the same way that you guys have focused on the fiat on ramp off ramp kind of piece of mm -hmm. the value chain. We have focused, yeah. uh, we have focused every kind of like a living bit of energy on essentially being as good on the credit side of crypto mm -hmm. as much as possible. And we're purely kind of institutional facing, so we don't we so so we don't deal with any uh, our retail customers. Uh, uh, you know that's your forte. So have fun with the retail segment. Uh, we, we, Not we, entirely anymore. We just uh, signed an LOI with Avanza, but I'll take it. Oh really? Yeah, that's true. That's true. So congrats yeah. on that as well. Uh, so so nowadays what we really do is that uh, if you think about a specific setting of Cephalo, right? So yeah. so it's 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 a local champion uh, here in Sweden and with bigger and larger. Uh, a partnership as you announce them, uh, you will continue mm -hmm. to fortify your kind of a local position against many other mm -hmm. international players and perhaps expand to other folks, uh, other, other places in the Nordics. And, and the thing here is that as the competition heats up in your segment, a lot of players like Cephalo are looking for a way to kind of uh, uh, to retain their customer longer so they don't end up flowing to Coinbase or whoever uh, they might they might prefer otherwise and the, the the very natural next step for folks like you is uh, is to really offer like investment products right and that's really what we do so we essentially package all the borrowing and lending and DeFi yield farming on all of those kind of activities at the back and then give you a set of apis uh, you plug it in so the next day you can offer the swedish uh, uh, customers essentially uh, cryptocurrency related investment products and we have this kind of partner based strategy to package all the lending and credits that we do at the back uh, just because we believe that's a much more scalable model compared to going to the retail directly in just a bit of an awkward situation if i have a set of api then i essentially compete for the same customer with you like it just doesn't work right so what's the regulatory setup for that and and how do you do you, you know, what level of protection uh, do you provide towards the end customer of, I guess, in this case, the institutional clients that you're working with? Yeah. So the way how you actually work at the back in terms of regulation is that we've been fully regulated by the Finnish FCA in mm. since 2019. And the very interesting thing, that's very a very interesting piece of uh, kind of... Uh, stamp that that we have that other people don't mm. have as far as i know is that we're the only people on earth as far as i know that have on earth all right no no i'll, I'll tell you I'll, I'll, there's a bit of a qualifying statement here is that uh we're as far as we know we're the only people on earth that have gotten a explicit written statement from a mm. regulator like a proper regulator like i'm sure you can go to some crappy island somewhere they will write you anything but let's take those off like Check. I would consider Finland as a proper kind of a regulatory yeah, onshore. You know what? Uh, I do too. Sweden's better, <laughs> but Finland is not that far behind. Oh, that's uh, an interesting statement. Why would you say yeah, that? Yeah. I have to jump. I have to jump on that one. Why no, would no, you say it, that? Uh, I, I think that's. Uh, I think as a as a foreign as an immigrant to this country, uh, as far as my understood, I think the things have always had a tiny bit of a some sort of an inferiority complex versus Sweden okay. probably due to, the, due to the historical context and whatnot, right? Like, who am I to say? Just, uh, just, uh, just a random observation. But back to what I was saying. So, so we're the only people who basically have a stamp from the Finnish FCA to essentially mm -hmm. conduct DeFi yield farming activities for other folks in a regulated setup. And did, I don't know work? anybody on earth that has that okay from the regulators. If you did you work like, with like them to, to to okay I, I I wouldn't dare to speak to that being the case uh, anywhere on Earth so I'll <laughs> I'll 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 take that as uh, you you are alone here on on this little <laughs> pale, pale blue dot did you work with the regulators to to help them understand this and define the, this space so yeah. they yeah, so they that took about a year there? so okay. so it took yeah. took us about a year to get like the first VASP registra registration. Right. Uh, so the virtual right. currency service provider or something is then this yeah. for something I don't remember anymore. And then yeah, it took roughly another, yeah. Then it took another nine months to get the DeFi thing. So okay. So it's really really like so it's because we do institution right, and then 
yeah. institutions are typically a bit more careful around all the regulatory stuff. So as a consequence, we've invested quite heavily over the past two years to get those regulatory mm -hmm. approval. And now mm -hmm. when we go to, say, larger financial institutions, it just, mm -hmm. as they come into this space, it's just a very different side of conversation, right? They, yeah. Do, how do you deal with the um, sort of the uh, evolution of this this space and and feeding that back to your to the regulator? Not that we have to talk just about regulators, but I'm kind of curious how you're uh, dealing with all the changes. Have you created a broad enough framework in that nine months that it captures a lot, or is there as well there's a new innovation and you constantly have like an update to to uh, the scope of the work that you do under that registration? So, 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 as as far as my kind of personal experiences with the Finnish regulators or regulators in general, right? The mm -hmm. thing they appreciate the most actually is no surprises. Yeah, no surprises at all. So, so we believe in this. Um, uh, you know, they're they are they are. You know, everyone's resources is constrained. There are many, many mm -hmm. things that the regulator need to do and, for, and fix and supervise. Crypto mm -hmm. is like a really big thing to us, but in grander scheme of things, it's not really. It's a tiny little vibrant yeah. asset class, right? Like in grander scheme of things of like global financial system, like it doesn't really move the needle yeah. the same way as Russian gas would. So, so it's, it's just cute and exciting. Yeah, right, right. Right. So, so it's exciting, but it's still very tiny. So you can't, you yeah. can't, you can't expect the regulator to spend a, like a, you know, truck tons of time on it. It's just not realistic. Right. So then mm -hmm. it's very much about in each market from what we're seeing, it doesn't really matter if it's like, you know, Germany, we're looking at UK or US It's typically the regulator works very closely with a few industry leaders in terms of mm -hmm. being like opinion leaders. Right. And then uh, there's no way to kind of update them are uh, regulated on everything that is happening on the market because that's just too much to ask however what you actually really really want to do is that you want to make sure every new thing that you will do you tell them beforehand and yeah. then you build that you build that trustworthiness because every time when you tell them i oh, hey we're trying we're doing this new thing inevitably mm -hmm. you're going to go into that conversation okay what is this thing you're doing how does it fit into your existing you know framework of regulatory setup blah 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 so that that kind of conversation just naturally rolls on as you roll off exactly. more and more things, right so uh, who are the thought leaders in in finland that uh, sit around the table with you guys uh so there's that i don't actually know because the conversation mm -hmm. we have with the regulators are almost always bilateral and the stuff mm -hmm. that we talk to them about is really sure. about it's, it's it's not on the buying and selling side of things right because we don't trade mm -hmm. anything it's very mm -hmm. much about like what do you do with the stuff once you have it type of a conversation so yeah. it's like a different layer it's a it's more kind of like on a derivative layer of things rather than the underlying asset type of things so mm -hmm. i actually don't know if they even go around elsewhere asking for opinions mm -hmm. i have no idea actually okay well, let's park this whole regulatory uh, part and let's move on to the cool part of what you guys are doing, how you're working and um, uh, yeah, how that is structured and, and, and what, who you're, like how you, how you work with the counterparties in uh, the yield farming uh, setup that you work with. Uh, yeah, so, you so, so, so if we take the specific example of uh, <clears throat> the uh, DeFi yield farming, right? So... Mm -hmm. So the way we explain at... for those who don't know what DeFi right. yield farming is, assuming basics. Right. So, so I think the easiest way to think about DeFi yield farming is the following. So, you have new protocols that's coming up all the time, right? And protocols mm -hmm. have different functions, or they're or they're supposed to have different functions and utilities for different group of people. So, for mm -hmm. example, Aave and Compound is more like an overnight lending market type of a thing. So they are on the credit yeah. side of things on DeFi. And then you have Avalanche of, you know, Uniswap and whatnot. That's more trading based, right? Yeah. And yeah. then in either way, those protocols need to go out and then do something. And the entire point of DeFi is that <clears throat> the funding base, the liquidity, let it be lending or trading, 
came from essentially the people, like the the mm -hmm. the, the anonymous masses, right? So that's where mm -hmm. it came from. And then you contribute those liquidities. The platform does what it's supposed to do, and you get mm -hmm. some sort of a reward, i.e., payment. So in the Uniswap case, you're basically a liquidity provider for providing. Okay. Uh, replacing the market makers okay fine you get a fee for that on lending mm -hmm. because you provide loans to people okay you got an interest for that so yeah. there's different setups but the general term of DeFi yield farming is to deploy capital into various kind of protocols to conduct various mm -hmm. activities to earn a somewhat passive income because you're not taking the Delta volatility on the price of the token somewhere. So it's a very different type of a payoff structure as opposed to, you know, buy a buy a coin somewhere and see what happens type of a thing. Are there more interesting models besides those two that either like are novel or that are less <laughs> exposed that you're seeing on the horizon or that you guys are actively looking at? Yeah, so so we basically scout essentially we go through everything that basically come up all the time right so i think in our current DeFi yield farming pool uh that, that that has that has i think like as of today like 50 or 60 million dollar worth of stuff at the moment um uh, mm -hmm. so at any given point in time that is spread out into around 10 protocols that does different type of things and then within mm -hmm. each protocol there's different liquidity pools right like a right. sub element of each pool, and then that's further diversified. The whole point is to mm -hmm. diversify between people, the protocol that are doing different things. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those guys comes and goes, if we, we've been doing it for about a year or so now, and if you compare how yeah. the portfolio looked like a year ago till today, it bears very little resemblance. The structure is mm -hmm. similar as in it's diversified, mm -hmm. and then we classify the risk based on different things. But what's actually in it is very different. So it's very, it's it's a passive, it's kind of like a f actively managed fixed income hedge fund type of activity. Like that's what yeah. it actually is at the end of the day. And then we essentially couple that with, uh, uh, we essentially couple that with like a regulatory framework so that institutions right. can chuck into it. Like that's that's essentially the setup really. So and it goes also into the selection of the protocols that you are engaging with. So you have you built that framework yourself or have you used something yeah. like, I don't know, the Howey test or whatever as a framework to, to assess what's uh, the suitability for that? Uh, so so we actually, so, so over the past year, we've invested quite a bit in terms of like capabilities and people specifically into this field because we see mm -hmm. tremendous amount of growth in this and it's just a matter of time until the institutional folks coming in right and we, yeah. we knew that because we've been talking to those people over the years we know what they're looking at and we know why yeah. they couldn't touch certain things for whatever reason it is right so the way we basically do that is that uh, we have techies that whenever there's a new protocol a new activity comes up so mm -hmm. we have people here that basically open up the kimono to look at the actual contract the technical code line by line, because mm. often what you end up seeing is that what the protocol tells you the thing does is not exactly the same as what it actually does. Mm. A lot of times there's a little bit of a, a finance around the corner. Like there, mm. there's a bit of like a tuning around the corner for like storytelling purposes. Right. I'm not saying there's like malicious content or something. It's just that mm. a lot of times- Can, can you give an example of that? Uh, I I don't want to throw anyone under the bus, but, but the, <laughs> I was hoping the, you would, though. <laughs> no, no, no. no like, I, I don't like. I think I think uh, I think most of those teams that we have over the years that we've had contact with are very well intentioned because the we don't mm. because it's it's actually not that difficult after you do this particular exercise to realize if they're a complete scam or not. If it's a complete scam, we we'll just drop it. We never talk mm. to them, right? But then typically if we see, okay, this thing kind of makes sense, at least in the current yeah. concept, current setting, and then we could uh, uh, we, 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 we could go for it, then then we would like then start talking to the folks, uh, talking to the to the folks behind it to really understand what it does, right? 
So that's that's where that's where you know perhaps the title of this this particular conversation comes from, which is that we see a lot of stuff that we know mm -hmm. is just gonna blow up sooner or later because because right. there's just there's just unsustainable economic factors at play that in long run it wouldn't work, right? So that's mm -hmm. you know that's like what we call time bombs. Like we don't touch those no matter what kind of APR you get all of those. And then there are a lot of good things that are happening that we think, okay, fine, this is a little bit immature, but we can see mm -hmm. a scenario in which that's going to work out and provide real life utilities, right? Like for example, a, 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 like the simplest example, Uniswap makes sense, right? Uniswap makes sense. It's not the most efficient yeah. thing on Mars. It never will be, but mm -hmm. it makes sense. There's a reason why this thing exists, but uh, 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 building stuff on Ethereum blockchain doesn't make sense because because the gas fees are so expensive. If you're a retail person, it makes no sense for you to do that. You should just mm -hmm. like you know take the credit risk, go to Binance and do your trading there. It's a lot cheaper, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you know replicating Uniswap on Solana makes sense. It just really makes sense, right? It's like such a clear thing. So that's a kind of a very simplistic, almost like a superficial. Uh, example, mm -hmm. but to illustrate the point that innovation is happening at such a speed and at such a breadth, kind of wide breadth, that uh, mm -hmm. that's impossible for any one person to to kind of uh, uh, to follow that up. So so we package that into a product so people don't have to do it themselves. And how many people in your team are, are are looking for these time bombs versus opportunities? Uh, so our DeFi team currently is around four people, but then that mm. particular team pulling tech folks to look at things whenever there's a reason mm. to do so. Is, is there any way for like what are the like the three takeaways for if somebody were to do it themselves? Now if you guys work with institutions and obviously try to take that yeah. risk away, but are they yeah. like, well, these are your three tips that you should be <clears> thinking <throat> of, or is it just goes too deep into the protocol to actually? um have a meaningful assessment as a as a retail user so well there, there there are two things to be considered here so the first is that you need to have the technical capability and the financial understanding and to kind of fully appreciate and understand what you're actually doing mm. right okay so easy then so so the probability of someone who have yeah, both of those skills set to begin with on the retail side as a person somewhere mm -hmm. is relatively mm -hmm. low. There are plenty of folks yeah. like this out there, but they're relatively low, right? Percentage because that already cuts out ninety nine point nine percent of the normal people out of this discussion, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. further, because most of the DeFi yield farming activity actually happens on Ethereum blockchain, as I mentioned, the gas fee is quite expensive. Unless you have a lot of capital, you can't effectively, you can't efficiently diversify because the gas mm. fees are so expensive. Because right. deploying a hundred million dollar is actually costs you the same as deploying a thousand dollars. So you need mm. to be technically capable to understand things, financially literally to understand the, the flow, and you have large amount of capital. It really doesn't sound like an individual to me anymore. So, so you guys doing it in a in a centralized way, essentially that you interact with you as a company. How do you look at, for instance, indexing protocol that might take different uh, uh, might take an index protocol towards the different yield opportunities? Is that competition? Do you see that as competition, or do you see that as uh, something you can leverage as well? I I, I think I think the the. So, so we actually thought about that long and deep. Should we do that ourselves, mm. right? And the conclusion we came up with was, was that I think the industry is too early for that, uh, for mm. a very simple reason. When you have so much, like if if the so 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 okay. So for example, indexing bunch of crypto to put it into a fund like structure right if you just buy a mm. whole bunch of tokens that may, that that could work because the underlying asset is homogeneous and easy enough to understand in order for that to be done efficiently if mm. if what you want to put into a basket it's not homogeneous in nature it's really really hard to standardize it to such a matter to make an index effectively 
like effective. Mm. Because what you what you're gonna end up doing is that like in one way or another, you need to have a centralized function somewhere to manually connect and select what goes into a basket. That has to be a human thing. Right. Because I haven't seen a machine that be able to somehow evaluate automatically. Like you might build something to compare all of the Uniswap stuff. Copy, what, wasn't copy. that what new Numerai was trying to do with the uh, sort of the uh, AI hedge funds of hedge funds uh, DAO approach. Good. I mean, yeah. in, in a how way, DAO. DAO... I mean, how did that <laughs> yeah. work? I don't, I don't know. I haven't looked at it recently. I mean, of course, there are there are a bunch of DAO initiatives where there's still the human element, but then it's you know decentralized. But you you think it it becomes more efficiently when you have a way for that protocol to work autonomously without a human component and you think the market is too early for that no I don't, or it's just I don't, not gonna happen period i i don't believe that's gonna happen really because mm. unless you do like a publicly voting based type of a system i.e a DAO of some sort yeah, uh, yeah. and and you know what happens when you give general masses the ability to elect things things go horribly wrong sooner or later Mm -hmm. Right. So so now the problem with, you know, having a centralized function as us is that we could make mistakes as well. But at mm -hmm. least in that particular setup, we have some level of efficiency. Mm -hmm. The effectiveness is doubtful regardless of the approach, because somebody have to make a call. It's mm -hmm. it's it's debatable whether a, a, a committee based system works better than a direct democracy system in this type of a thing, right? Like there's pros and cons on both. I think there's argument for both. And we've decided in this current setting, it just doesn't make sense for to, mm -hmm. to like fully decentralize that. Maybe we will one day, not now, according yeah. to us. So we're just going to stick with what we have. But then the way to kind of go around that particular problem is that so, 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 for example, the the issue of uh, the issue of dic for example, issue of dictatorship is not necessarily that uh, uh, there's too much concentration of power, right? Singapore works just fine as a dictatorship, really. The problem mm -hmm. is really that most dictatorship di dictatorship lacks transparency and a governance model upon which if things goes wrong, what can the rest of the society or people do something about it? Like that's really, mm. that's really like the downfall of any centralized structure is, let it be in finance or otherwise, right? So what we're trying to do is that we have institutional counterparty, right? But we provide enough transparency to the counterparty by basically saying, Here's the decision we're making. Here's why we're making those decisions. And here is what is happening everywhere. If you see something that is horribly wrong at that point moment, according to you, you're more than welcome to just move your money away. Right? right. Like if you don't agree with my governance model, that's perfectly fine. Like just take the money and leave. You're a transparent you dictator is what you're telling us, Ichan. <laughs> No, no, I, I don't think it's a dictatorship. Like dictatorship is just another way to say that you have a committee-based decision-making system, right? Like a European Union runs on basically a bunch of commissions and the commissions are essentially the decision-making bodies. Is that a dictatorship? Mm -hmm. Not really, but is it mm -hmm. di di dictatorial in the sense that there's a lot of concentration of power? Yes, absolutely. Right, and, so, and of course, in a free market example, people can take their money elsewhere. Yeah, exactly. It's hard, harder if you're. It's harder in a nation state, you know, if we we're like going the geopolitical route here, which would be an interesting discussion. But let's see, <clears> of course, <throat> there solve this financial part. But there, you can you can of course vote with with your money to say, well, I yeah. don't agree with your model and your commercial company in the mouth. Yeah, it's a it's a bit it's a bit like if you think about you know leadership in the classic kind of Greek setting. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in ancient Greek, when it was kind of invented, like ele electoral democracy as a concept, mm -hmm. like what do you do? Mm -hmm. You you have certain you have certain ideas. You stand on the street corner and you tell everybody, "This is what I believe." If you agree with me, come with me, vote for me, support me in whatever case, right? That's really just leadership mm -hmm. democracy type of a thing, and that's what we're doing here, which is that we will make the decision, but here are the framework, and here's what we're gonna do. And we will let you know how we do everything as we go. And if you're not happy, 
you know, you can uncast your vote at any time, which is just and, and, like, yeah. Well, and what we're seeing in DAOs, that some of the DAOs struggle with that leadership issue uh, from a sort of structural yeah. point of view. At some, so even uh, Ethereum, I think, in a, uh, like uh, Vitalik in a recent interview said he wanted to stay, he, he originally took that step back in the Ethereum community and he said, okay, well, I guess there is leadership needed to move this forward to where it sort of should be going. So full decentralization from a governance point of view seem to have these natural problems in how things are moving forward. But then again, I guess there are structures that are working, but uh, uh, some type of leadership here always kind of emerges that pushes things a little bit further. In Bitcoin, it was Satoshi anonymously that obviously also was the leader of that project until it sort of disperses and people took over. Now, one could argue whether it has been able to innovate at the same pace if Satoshi, Satoshi was still leading it, but I wouldn't touch that Bitcoin maximalism. I mean, the, the, <laughs> the, the, other, the, the other thing, the other thing that is super, super important to remember is that we like DeFi is really about distribution and access. What DeFi is doing, mm -hmm. it's it's a marginal innovation on what you know all the banks and financial institutions are doing. Like the actual functionality of mm -hmm. the product that it provides is a marginal improvement. What it what is a paradigm improve like level of like investment is really the distribution and providing access to retail people, right? Mm -hmm. It's really yeah. not relevant for us because we deal with institutions. There's like a hundred of them out there all together globally. Yeah. I don't need to decentralize anything because there's a hundred of them. Worst case scenario, I put them in a Zoom call. Everyone's fine, yeah. right? You can't do that if you're you're facing millions and millions of counterparties on the other side, and then that that demo, de democratization of that distribution and decision making become relevant, like proportionally more important. Like for us, mm. it's really not relevant. Like, what's the point of decentralizing a thing that has like you know ten participants? In it? Yeah, there's no. Reason. It's kind of interesting, like that kind of discussion on this distribution and liquidity. It was also around the security token offerings where there were a lot of protocols that were creating uh, around security tokens, but then they were uh, required to fit into existing uh, equity regulation and it ends up, okay, but if you really want distribution, you're still better off going with a regular uh, um, trading platform that is traditionally yeah. regulated. So they ended up, a lot of these protocols and parties that were trying to create STO offerings ended up with no liquidity. And, and a token yeah. that couldn't be distributed because they're hindered by the, the legislative part of it. Uh, yeah. And then you had companies like Binance that tried to create like these uh, synthetic kind of stocks following this, the stock, which was then also put to, uh, to rest. Um, uh, so, yeah, if you're dealing with very few counterparties, I suppose that it doesn't matter. It doesn't uh, matter. So and, and, and what about your client, client base? What, what does it look like? What, like you talked about local uh, leaders like Cefalo is, what, what other types of uh, clients do you see in the market? Who is the customer base of uh, Tesseract? Yeah, so, so for us, when you really think about it, we're basically looking for whoever that sits on a bunch of assets that came from mm -hmm. elsewhere, right? So that, that's like, you know, a, a retail platform such as you guys, like custodians and other bucket and basically all the all the financial institution out there are in one way or another falling to that box mm. right so 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 those are the type of folks we're gunning for and the one we're concentrating the most are you know retail platforms such as a fellow uh okay. you know around the world because we have the regulatory yeah. standing to do a lot of things that people want but they yeah. can't do it themselves okay so there you see yeah. most traction today essentially yeah, yeah, because it's the easiest one, right? Because if you go to say a asset manager in Germany, you have to explain to them what crypto is, and then you can talk about what is it that we do with yeah. Safello, with you. I don't need to explain what crypto is, right? I go straight yeah. to why this makes sense. So that's like half yeah. of the half of the conversation is cut off, so it's just easier. And what is it, what is the time from us Safello? Like, well, we we know you guys, but from the starting point to full implementation and starting to generate like yield for your end customers? It, 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 what, what does that process look like for you? Six to eight weeks. Agency? Six to eight weeks? Yeah. Including so the, the onboarding, the diligence and the implementation and so on. 
Yeah, so so the so it's actually really really fast to do the technical integration. The technical mm -hmm. integration probably takes less than one quarter of the time that I just quoted. The rest mm -hmm. are basically, you know, introducing ourselves, talk about the commercials, how does the deal look like, uh, mm -hmm. and then typically a big chunk, like up to half of the time, is spent on discussing uh, precisely what is a regulatory setting that will make this mm -hmm. feasible. So, yeah. so there's a lot of discussion like that, uh, mostly. And then once that is decided, the technical integration is really, really straightforward because we design the product in such a manner that we ask ourselves if Cephalo were to integrate with us, how do we build yeah. a product that you do the least amount of work because everyone is short on techies, right? I mean, that's just an industry, industry wide. That's true. On the, on the inflow of capital, is it, um, Primarily crypto assets, or are you also then taking fiat assets and turning Both. them into crypto assets? Okay, all right. Uh, so, so we don't do any conversion. So, so right. So, for example, like let, let's imagine you guys, right? Like you would have the capability to essentially flip the dollars into a stable coin. Yeah, right. That's literally what you guys do. So, yeah. so, <clears throat> and to us, frankly, well, we don't we don't have stable coins today, but you know. Right, right, right. But, but, but like, but like most, like, that's not a far, that, that's not like no. a like a big step for no. you guys, obviously, right? So then right. the point really becomes that to us, there's no difference between a USDC and a dollar to us at this moment. There's a, and, and, and we actually prefer the stable coin version just because it moves around faster. Right. right? Like moving dollars is such a pain in the ass even today. It just, we, we are perfectly fine doing it. And then we do have people who specifically want to just not touch crypto, fine. Mm -hmm. But uh, but but uh, but yeah, it's uh, to us, it's, it's all sorts of uh, all sorts of tokens. Do you mostly see crypto assets, inflow or fiat inflow? Or, well, or there's always a conversion in between it, you guys all take the crypto. It really depends on where. So, so for example, in Asia, where, mm -hmm where you see a lot of countries with somewhat unstable local currencies uh, a mm -hmm. lot of companies are actually slowly moving into a situation they settle trades with usdt okay and so 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 think about how weird that is you basically have a unregulated crypto version of a thing that basically runs fractional reserve banking that is naturally accepted as the de facto trade currency <laughs> in Asia. Like that's actually yeah. happening, which was just really weird to me why people are doing that. But then you understand their position once you once you figure out how difficult the mm -hmm. alternative is and, or like how annoying the alternative is. When you say Asia, what what particular like how what countries do you include in that sort of oh, yeah the so this, which this is mostly from the indian continent subcontinent all the way down to southeast entire southeast asia the far east is a little bit different so the korean chinese and the japanese typically have much stronger regulation with this kind of things mm. and their currency mm. are are large enough that they're kind of stable but if you go to right. indonesia like 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 philippines is like a whole different story because your currency is so tiny that it's volatile by nature, right? Like the Chinese yuan, the government will come up to do something yeah. if there's actual volatility picking up somewhere. Uh, the smaller yeah. countries don't have the capability nor the bank, like a bank, res like foreign reserve to do anything, really. But in particular, in the Philippines, I, I, I uh, understand that the play to earn a kind of NFT model where people just go straight to, to, to engage in e economically around. Uh, things like Axie Infinity uh, currency, uh, and just skip all the sort of traditional cryptocurrencies altogether. Just you know, they start having these payments in in these local currencies. Uh, how do you? How, well, side question: How do you look at that that phenomenon in relation to like USDT as the reserve currency and uh, the ability to tap into that for Tesseract potentially? Uh, so. So we actually also looked into those stuff and our view currently is that it's interesting, but let's see how sustainable that is. I think okay. a version, a sustainable version of the application 
of this kind of gamified tokenized type mm. of a thing that has a real value in life i believe mm. that's going to happen in one way or another mm. Mm. i am not so confident that axie is going to be the thing right oh it's just an I'm example not... of the model yeah right. you're right uh and exactly what i mean the the other thing the other thing i think is worth discussing is that just because something's happening doesn't mean we should take it as a given it makes sense right it's a bit like what mm. vitalik said the other day in the time magazine which is that it's okay for you to use ethereum as a foundation to play video games with a monkey picture that's worth two million dollars it's okay right i mean it's a, it's a free world you do whatever you want to do you be you but yeah it's really not the point of ethereum to do that kind mm. of stuff because, or at least it wasn't the original goal to do so, right? Now you yeah. ask, you ask yourself, uh, is it good for Philippines, Southeast Asia, or humanity as a whole, in which your revenue income came from, you know, playing video games? Fine. That that I is mean, the world World of Warcraft model that that is already quite a couple of years old. I think Brock Pierce started with basically <laughs> having whole armies of people just digitally mining the world of Warcraft world and, and people were making a living that. So yes, it's, it's, yes, it's kind of I, a reinvent the model. It's, it's okay. I think it's perfectly fine to do this kind of a thing, but it's debatable, mm -hmm. at least in my mind, whether or not that is a good use of humanity's time because that's right. actually all the resources there are. Your like the economic growth is based on your capital growth of which human like humans are human capital yeah. is one of the three main components, right? And you say, does it make sense to put everybody on Axie to earn an income that is higher? Like what is the benefit to society? I don't see that. The only the only counter argument that I have seen to that is that it is a more sustainable thing than people basically using the physical environment to consume, to interact with. It's, it's a messed up argument, but basically if you put, put everybody in a virtual, in the metaverse, and that's where they're consuming, the consuming digital items, they wouldn't be buying like a physical good, right? So if you think about VR, your VR apartment, today you would furnish it with like Ikea furniture, right? And that has some impact on the environment. The future might be you're sitting in a pretty empty apartment, but your whole surroundings are NFTs. You know, that, and you that, have like lenses that, or your that, or your eyes. That argument, I totally buy. That argument, mm. I absolutely buy. Now, the problem that I have with this current play to earn model is that right. the play to earn model currently rests entirely on this kind of. It's like the game you don't like. It's not a game you play. It's not chess. It's like a grinding game. You grind your time right. for. Like that, I think, if, if we well, it depends were... depends which to, game, of course. I mean, it depends which game. In, in Axie, for example. Yeah. It's very much of like, you, you, it's the, you're exchanging your time, really, for money. Yeah. Your, so your so Rare is maybe a better, so Rare is maybe a better example okay, of where fine. it's really about the this, this skill, right? So, so, I mean, yeah, that's an example. Well, it, it's, yeah. I, I do I do agree like having human capital to to do like random stuff just to earn a living that way. Um, well, to, I'll give you another yeah. example. I'll give you another example. So because the 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 if we're if we think if we think sweatshops is not a good use of a uh, human's time in real life, why mm. is it that you know like what's the difference between that and just basically like grind a game? Uh, make oh, some like money. Analogy. Like it's, it's, yeah, a no, digital, I, I... it's a digital sweatshops that you just pay people yeah. more. You incentivize people to engage themselves in a sweatshop-like well, activities by paying them more. Okay, fine. The, the only harsh upside to that right now is that some people are able to actually make a living that aren't able to make a living before, just because they're able to get access to a virtual environment where they do this this kind of work. But of course. In in on the whole and looking outward, it is nothing different than a sweatshop, right? So hmm. uh, I I do think it makes sense to look at more human sustainable models around that. Um, and with that said, I think we need to go to the Q and A. 
I mean, we could talk forever about, <laughs> about this, but I think there's, there's a couple of questions here. Uh, are you able to pull something up, uh, Matt, or what are we seeing here? Uh, question one, you, you can, can you give examples of DeFi protocols that you are using? Maybe some ups and downs and potentially expected returns. Ooh, expected returns. That sounds nice. Uh, so, so, so basically all of the type of user suspects that you will think of, we are probably there, right? Like Aave, Compound, Uniswap, Avalanche. Uh, mm. uh, the, the list goes on and on in such a like balancer harvest like you know those kind of things come and go so we we use uh we use quite a, a quite, quite quite a lot of them uh, and the point is to use uh, uh use quite a, a lot of them what we've yeah. also learned what we also learn in terms of like the return profile is that you really need to actively manage this particular bucket of activities because the volatility in the yield comes up and down so much, right? A big component, mm. a big component of the yield actually came from the fact that the platform themselves is bootstrapping the liquidity by providing absurdly high return by giving you their token. Like a big chunk of the return came in that form. So there's like the actual utility-based returns, like trading fees from Uniswap. And then yeah. on the other side, there's also providing liquidity here. We will give you, you know, token X. So, yeah. so those are the two buckets. And then this one, like the fee is sustainable, but they are very small. The other one are very big and they never last. So what you see is that depending on the relative proportion of those two things, you need to move, you need to do mm. essentially a portfolio rebalancing type of activity mm -hmm. on a constant basis, sometimes you know more than once a day. So, so those are the type of things you should, yeah. Mm -hmm. th those and so yeah. So expected return as a concept doesn't really matter all that much because you are ba because we're basically taking a view. The entire view is not that long. Mm -hmm. Right. If your entire view on a a protocol is that okay, probably six months later they will disappear. Then what is the expected return? Interesting. Is that the, so? That's the time horizon. You look at these protocols on a six-month horizon, or certain certain uh, protocols. Some of them. And, some of them. Yeah. Obviously, some of them we we see. Okay, this can be something like serious. But then a lot of them, you look at them. You look at them. You're like, yeah, another copycat. They'll be gone in like six mm. months, probably. But then you still take that six months opportunity just to to maximize the returns for your end customers. Well, six months is a long time in crypto. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 so even yeah. though you see that that particular project's like, well, there's there's no sustainability in this model here for our clients. It's still in their best interest to just take still advantage of that six months, so you would be able to support that protocol just to take advantage until it sort of dies out. Yeah, I mean, like we're not in the we're not in the business of being the guardian angel of DeFi as a community, right? Like our job mm -hmm. is not to ensure the uh, like everything in DeFi flourishes. That's not our point. That's not no. our mandate. Not our job. Our job is to make the correct allocation decisions for our customers for as mm -hmm. long and as often as we could. Mm -hmm. That's our job. Right. So yeah. so we look at it not from, oh, this is a really cool project. We should chuck money there. Like, no, we're not a VC investor. We're not chucking mm -hmm. money into something that has you know, a great potential. We evaluate mm -hmm. them in like a relatively short time span. Does it make financial sense for anyone to put money there or not? That's it, really. Nothing more. Which protocol do you find most interesting right now? <sighs> I mean, the one that I find, uh, th there's a lot of protocols that I find very interesting that has nothing to do with what we do. Is okay. so so for, for, so so for example, there's there's protocols up on which is built on Web three that essentially is like a like a Web three version of Spotify. I think that's a great mm. idea because mm. if, for anyone who's ever looked into how the music royalty system exactly. works. You will realize yeah. how much of a cluster mass that is. You will realize anything is better than mm. that. Right. Which protocol so, is that? Or which project is that? 
it, was it called SoundCloud or something? Like uh, I can I, I can look it up. Like it did you. sound well. SoundCloud is a quite an old. No, no, it's, not, it's something say. else. Like let, let me figure it out and, and send it to you. I, I like the name is. Getting, All right. It's show notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Show okay. notes. Let, let's see. Show notes. <laughs> yeah, we have. We, I don't know if we've kept up with show notes uh, this season so well, but we hmm. will uh, add it. Uh, how? Let's see. What What do you have? Why would you use Ethereum if the gas fee on Polygon is much lower? Another question. Yeah, so that's uh, that's actually fairly straightforward. It's actually a function of how much capital you can deploy, right? If you have a thousand bucks, like this is not an issue. If you have a hundred million, this is a very big issue. Po the Polygon mm -hmm. gas, the Solana pools might be very cheap, but if the entire pool is ten million, you know, like how much money can you ch like deploy there? Like most of the assets and then activity still resides on Ethereum because liquidity attracts liquidity, right? It's, uh, it's a thing. So, you know, until the day it makes economic sense, uh, it'll be a rebalance between different ecosystems. And those ecosystems don't really talk to each other that well just yet. Or, some, or, or you know, jump try with a wormhole, see how that goes. Uh, 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 so, 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 so it's merely a economic allocation decision again. Mm. So economies of skill are a thing in this protocol war uh, when it comes to yield farming. Sorry, what? But, but, but that 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 economies are of skill are a thing in this war of um, yield farming. But I guess protocols can stay pre, uh, still break through that. It, it, economy, have, you know, it, it, economy of scale is one thing. The other yeah. thing is the absolute size, right? So say if yeah. you were to invest in countries in general, uh, yeah. uh, uh, you will never have enough money to kind of invest in China. But if it's a Pacific mm -hmm. island with a GDP of like you know total of like you know fifty million dollar a day, some of the largest mm -hmm. hedge funds couldn't put a position on because they're too small to do anything meaningful. Right. So it's not so much about <laughs> the economy of scale; it's just that the absolute size of opportunity is too small for you to care. So it's more like that. So yeah, so it's not um, to care, but also because if you deploy that capital, then you impact the protocol in, in too much yeah, of a way. You just, where, yeah, you right? just literally destroy. You, you don't want to be the only guy exactly. doing everything there. It just doesn't make any sense, right? No. So, so it's so, like uh, the Warren Buffett, like if you are a small penny stock, uh, you should be focusing on smaller caps because he needs to deploy a lot more capital. Um, yeah. So he needs yeah. to focus on the big fishes. All right. Yeah, even um, if the rates are higher, the fees are lower. It, it just doesn't make because it doesn't move a needle otherwise. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, I guess we have final one here. Oh, I guess for those who are novel, uh, new to the yield farming, um, how it works in practice for the exper inexperienced audits. How and when do you get your yields, both directly on DeFi and also through Testeract? I guess that's an end user perspective. I would assume. Yeah, yeah. So I think I think if you're, you know, if you consider yourself to be relatively tech savvy and you know something about crypto, I encourage you to just set up a MetaMask and try it yourself. And mm. in about a week, you'll realize this is super super fun, but it makes no sense for you to do it as an individual. Like it's super fun, yeah. like you know, but it makes no economic sense because the gas mm. fee itself is gonna eat all of your money in a week, and you'll be literally left with nothing. But that's okay. Like you know, it's a fun learning experience, and the because we don't like so we take like kind of like a larger family offices as a uh, uh, customer, and then we you know deploy like you know clips of millions at a time. So that type mm -hmm. of a that's the closest thing we have to an individual, which is a family office, right? But otherwise, mm -hmm. what I would do, what I would do is I, I will stay clear of firms. I will stay clear of a lot of those retail-facing platform like Nexos and Celsius because what they actually do at the back is a combination of, of all sorts of things. All of them have a trading desk, so your money is yeah. being act actively traded. Your money is being mm -hmm. lent out to people, collateralized and uncollateralized, un and part of your money is going to different DeFi yield farming pools to try different things. So, and you have so, zero idea how where your money is basically. <laughs> on that that no because you, that was the final question for me i think we need to then unfortunately yeah. wrap it up but uh, you mentioned that transparency and you mentioned uh, uh, uh we talked about the leadership but how yeah. do you how do you provide that transparency to your end customers 
Uh, yeah. How do you like how? Because it is about where is my money right now? Where is it locked up? And how do I? Uh, what uh, guarantees do I have that you guys, you know, don't do yeah. whatever with that, that crypto? I'll, right. I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. So, so for example, one we work with. So, so let, let's say Cephalo and Tesseract integrate together to so that you can launch this product in Sweden to your customers, right? So it just happened. That, yeah. So so at that point, what we provide you is essentially mm. a break anonymous anonymized breakdown of where the money is. So obviously it doesn't mm. make sense for me to tell you exactly who we're lending money to at that specific moment, but I'll anonymize that information that I'll give it to you. Right. So then you basically have the breakdown of the loan book at any given point in time on like a pie chart level. Okay. And then it's up to you to decide how much of that information you're going to transpire to your retail customers, because that's a relationship between you and your retail customer. And it has like, I have nothing to do with that. Like I provide can you give an you... example. Of... Can you give an yep. example of the pie chart? What would that slice of the pie show me then if it's anonymized, it would show me. Yeah. Which so, so, so... Or... Uh, so 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 for example so, so i'll give you an example right so 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 let's take uh, the other thing that is very important to remember here is that we let you choose what product mm. you want to go into i think it's perfectly fine for people to take whatever risk you want to take but you need to tell mm. people you're taking the risk right you can't right. combine three activities and then package them as a bank like saving account because it's not the same thing Right. right. So, so for example, first of all, uh, uh, Cephalo's customer in this case will be able to determine, okay, do I want to do DeFi yield farming or do I want to do borrowing and lending? Do I want to, you know, mm. touch some like, fancy hedge fund structure that I'm, I don't have access to? What is it that you actually mm. want? You can actually choose what you want. Right. So that's mm. step one. So that's a transparency mm. you're not going to get anywhere else. And the second mm. one, let's take lending as example. So, once the lending comes in, at any given point in time, we will provide information to you to basically tell you the healthiness of the loan at any given point in time. Mm. Because your money will go into a bigger pool with other people's, uh, with, with you know, a bunch of other platforms such as yourself, then it's being loaned out to the other. So you will mm. see like where you are in the pool relative to everyone else and what type mm. of people on the other side is currently boring the same and then you decide okay. yeah that other part of the slide which is obviously where the risks resides how do you represent that because it's anonymized right or or the, yeah it is anonymized type. because yeah because yeah. i cannot tell you like you know alameda is boring currently at it, you know x amounts at, like that I exactly I so what will i see on the on the pie, pie chart in that case so in the pie chart you will basically see uh, essentially, you know, a, a will categorize the borrower. So you will see like a large market, make, or like a delta neutral. Market okay, all right. That, that was our risk yeah. profile and that type of a thing, right? So you will have, you you will know what type of people they are, but you won't know who they are. I'm, exactly. Yeah. And that to close off is how you avoid the ticking time bomb and <laughs> all about transparency. Trying to round this up in a good way. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Uh, okay. Great, great. Full circle. Uh, thanks so much for joining again. I want to, you know, this should be a regular thing. Uh, we really didn't touch it. We were close to touching geopolitics, and I, 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 I thought we stick with the topic, but maybe one day that would be uh, fun to dive deeper. Let's, uh, let's not piss off too many people at the same time. So <laughs> exactly. That was we kind of my thought today. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's like one thing my, my friend told me back in the day. It's like you can be a brave person. Uh, you, you can be a person with a limited amount of courage and pick a fight with a small amount of group of people like, you know, yeah. us. Or you can be a brave person and pick up a fight with a large group of people like the Chinese population. You know, it's up to you to decide, like, how big of a fight you want to have. Yeah. So how big is your fight? Narrow. I think our fight is relatively okay because when we go to the market, uh, uh, one, there's not exactly like this product is currently not really offered to any people, really. Mm. Uh, so, so we have a tech based kind of a solution. And then because we offer this transparency, uh, I think like it's just it, it's not super difficult to convince people why they should pick this. Right. So, so it's not so much of a fight, but rather just, you know, try to 
try to change things a little bit and make things a little bit better in the in, in, in our limited capacity if possible. Awesome. So you heard okay. it here first. Tesseract is not a ticking time bomb. And thank you so much, Etienne, for joining today. And I hope to see yep. you on the next one. This was yep. episode 20. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. Have a good Until day. Until next time. Yeah.